Okay, today we are joined by Grant Fowler. Uh, most of you watching this podcast should be familiar. Um, if not, go check out his Instagram. He's got a lot of really cool stuff. One of the voices in the industry that I stop to pay attention to, which is not really the case with too many voices these days, just because there's so much repetition and I just kind of see the same themes being hit over and over again in ways that I'm not super interested in, but definitely not the case with your approach. Um, I wanted to just get into how you guys kind of started talking. I know like uh, uh, Nate, you've been following Grant for quite a while. Uh, Grant just recently kind of found out about the stuff that we're doing. Um, Nate, what kind of drew you to, to Grant's work uh, right off the bat? Uh, there were a couple instances of like overlap where I'd seen someone who wasn't quite doing the niche stuff or wasn't in the niche environment I was in doing very uh, selectively uh, isolated exercises. The one in particular that I'd seen you were doing on a, uh, I don't know what this machine's called aside from like a, a pull-up machine with like the, yeah, know, you'd put the side leg and then you were doing some like uh, side leg presses on the thing, letting it come up, go down. Uh, I'd only done that once before with like my one, uh, I don't even know what to call her best way to describe her is like my in influencer client. And she was like jamming out on, uh, booty building, all that kind of stuff. And I was like, oh damn, cool. So he's creative with it. He likes to, likes to explore stuff. That's not necessarily archetypal. Uh, and then when you started to do stuff that was more in line with your personality, less so in line with the narrative. So there was stuff to like actually facilitate some engagement for you. Or you weren't just trying to justify it. I'm going to be so intense against you guys. It was like for the sake of facilitating something you needed to put out there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think uh, with the assisted chin up machine, I mean, just that alone. I mean, there's so many exercises that you can do on that. I think that's a really that's if I could give, you know, if somebody asked me and they were like, what would be one machine that you would just absolutely have to have? you had to choose one it would probably be that one and you rarely see anybody doing anything on that machine aside from like maybe pull-ups and dips you know that's really the only thing that it gets used for but i mean you can do iron crosses i just started doing those recently i know we kind of had a connection on that in terms of how we looked at i guess the lats and the rib cage in terms of you know, how you pressurize when you're doing the exercise and some of like the uh, intent that goes into the movements. And I think that's kind of a good bridge between, you know, what you were talking about with the assisted chin-up machine and then some of the similarities between, you know, how we both look at uh, training and movement where it's not just the exercises that you're choosing. It's also the intent but it's not just the intent, it's also the exercise, right? And it seems like there's kind of not really a lot of people in fitness right now that like can marry both of those sides really well. You have people that are just like completely on the, uh, like maybe it's like a PRI type paradigm, where it's, it's all sensation based. It's, it's all about, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with focusing on these things, but breathing, feeling things. And then you have people on the opposite side of the spectrum now where it's like you have the optimal crowd where it's just about, OK, I put my arm here and I just need to pull in this motion and I'm good. Right. And there, there needs to be both. Right. There's kind of the sensation side of things, the uh, feeling what I'm doing, being able to connect to the movement. And then there's also the mechanic side of things, which I think a lot of people are trying. It's like this polarized war now between like. You have people just focusing on mechanics and then you have people just focusing on like breathing and sensation. And I think I, I guess if I could describe what I do from a movement or a training standpoint, it would just be kind of marrying, you know, both of those things together. And I know you do a lot of that as well. So my curiosity on that, I know that a lot of people don't contextualize, um, say, like making an effort. And understanding that some of that effort is lost to uh, input intensity. Like a lot of people will go into the breathing side because they're trying to foster, oh, I, I have this sensation in me that I don't really know how to regulate. Let's go into that. Or a lot of people will go into the biomechanics side because they're really fixated on being kind of controlling with the results they want. And they don't care about how it feels. They don't care about objectively uh, or subjectively what the experience is like so much that 
they just want to get it so it looks a certain way before they can take it to another step. Uh, oh, no. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was thinking something else, but yeah, exactly. What what is the thing that contextualizes that? How do you get the ability to marry the two without having to learn it? What do you think gave you that perspective, or what made you want for that? I don't know. To be honest, I I don't think there is uh, a way to get it right necessarily because I don't think it's necessarily about, you know, people have this idea that there's like a perfect way to do things where there's like, I guess this perfect combination that you can find between like sensation based training. And I guess what some people would call, you know, I guess like a biomechanics oriented training. Um, I don't really think there is a, a 100% like, okay, this is exactly how it has to be done. I think there's just certain contexts and situations where you're going to have to kind of navigate that based on the person that's in front of you. Um, you know, I have a lot of clients that will do some of my programs that I, like, I just give them a program and they're fine. Right. Okay. Do this exercise, put your arm here, do this exercise, put your legs here and it's fine. Right. And then you have other people where like, sometimes that's just not enough. Um, it, it's kind of hard to give definitive I guess, examples of when that would or wouldn't be the case. It Again, it, it's kind of just case by case, just kind of depends on the person in front of you, I think. Um, but that's really just what my entire, like, training history has been, I guess, is really just trying to kind of tie all that stuff together in a way that, that's productive, um, where you have, even if you're doing, like, a sensation based drill. I always want there to be, and I guess this is kind of where you can get into the practical side of it. If I am doing something that's sensation based, unless I have somebody that's just like completely new to training, right. And they're just going to respond to anything like somebody that's like super old and maybe they've never trained um, or somebody that's like really under trained any drill that I choose. I want to get people to a point where like they can continue doing that drill and progressing, right? Like if you're doing a sideline breathing drill or you're doing some of these PRI things, I think you get to a point where it kind of just becomes pointless. It's like, okay, you've learned how to breathe. Maybe you've you've gotten the uh, the details down in terms of what you need to be feeling, how you need to be executing certain things. Once you get to a certain point, that drill is going to become pointless if you don't have a way to kind of, progress it. And I don't mean progressive overload in the sense that you need to add weight. Um, but there needs to be a way to progress it in terms of, you know, maybe it's getting harder from a, a perceived effort standpoint, right? There needs to be different ways that you can kind of modify that exercise to continue to streamline that process, right? So I've taken a lot of PRI exercises, like you have the, the sideline, uh, you have people against the wall where they're doing um, you know, they're trying to find like their left or their right glute and I'll have people add a little bit of weight to that. I mean, it's the simplest thing, right? It's just a basic PRI drill, but you just add a little bit of weight to it. Right. And you can do that in like really small increments, like, you know, where you add like one or two pounds every session or even less. Um, I'm a really big fan of using fractional plates. So like 0.25, 0.5, because with stuff like that, you can kind of marry the benefits of like sensation based training where you're not losing the benefits of what you're supposed to be feeling when you do that exercise by like jumping in weight too fast. You can add like half a pound or a pound. And so it's this really steady, slow increase where you can kind of maintain these parameters that you've set in place, like uh, what muscle am I supposed to feel? How am I supposed to breathe? Right. I think a lot of people make the mistake of trying to like add weight too fast to stuff like that. And then they lose the sensation, they lose the position, and then it just becomes another weight lifting exercise. Right. You're, you're just like trying to progressively overload something. So I'm a really big fan of using fractional plates, just taking very basic sensation based exercises, things that, um, you know, are very like mind muscle connection based i guess you could say and then just progressing them really really slow so you get the benefits of progressive overload but you're not losing the parameters that you've set in place in terms of what you're supposed to feel where you're supposed 
supposed to feel it, how you're supposed to feel it, and things like that. I got a topic. If you don't have anything you want, yeah, to I was gonna say that the the idea of um, the compensation patterns that we have, you can kind of eliminate those or really fine tune what those other patterns of sensation are through those like mind muscle connections, those lo that lower level stuff. But I, mm -hmm. I think people get scared of the intensity, like making it so that it's not such a clear like, oh, I've got it thing. Especially when you start talking about like more dynamic stuff, even just a simple like back squat. Um, and I think people don't really know how to bridge the gap between like, okay, I've got the connection here and then just being able to trust it in like a, now the, the, the test, the, the, what I want to be working towards ultimately, do you, obviously the fractional plates are an example of a progression of that. Do you find that there's sometimes like a, almost a mindset switch that you have to like help people get through? For sure. Yeah. I have a because I do work with a lot of athletes, at least in person, I don't train a whole lot of people in person anymore just because of my schedule. But when I, when I do work with people in person, it's almost always athletes. And so typically with an athlete, it, it obviously depends on, you know, the person obviously, and, the, and even the sport too, but you get a lot of people that are very, I guess you could say like extra receptive, like they're, they're more oriented on what's going on. Uh, on around them you know like they're very extroverted type individuals uh and that's what sport is right you're you're not really like tuning into your body that much you're kind of like focusing on things outside of you obviously um because that's sports and i think with a lot of athletes you kind of get people that have a really hard time like calming down and learning how to like put their intention and their effort into something like small right because they love doing jumps if you put 500 pounds on their back and you got like 10 people screaming at them, they love that kind of shit. But when it comes to like, Hey, like, you know, put a band around your arm and I want you to go like real slow and like turn your arm in and feel your rotator cuff or whatever it is. Um, or a breathing drill, you know, it, they, they want to rush through it because they, they're always task oriented. They're like external. Uh, they're focused on, on things that are external. So how much weight can I move? How can I get from point A to B fast? Um, as opposed to focusing on like, okay, you know, screw the weight, screw, <clears throat> you know, um, the, all of the metrics, that side of things. And let's just focus on how it feels. Right. And then you have people, you have two camps, you have people that are either they all of their training is focused on metrics and numbers and, you know, um, what you would call just. I guess, yeah, just metric based training. And then you have people that are kind of on the opposite side of that spectrum where it's, it's all sensation, you know, it's um, never add weight to any, anything, you know, you gotta, I mean, I know dudes that I kid you not have had people do ISO split squats where they've been doing the same ISO split squat for two years. And they're like, nah, dude, you can't, you're not engaging your glute and your groin good enough. It's like, dude, it's been two years. <laughs> like, That's if you can't engage the right muscles after two years, what's the point of all this sensation based training if you haven't gotten it down yet? You know, yeah. and so to be like a bridge between the two where it's like, okay, how do we get somebody from here? If they're, or if they're over here, how do we get them here? If they're over here and all they do is sensation based training, how do we get them out of their bodies to where they can, they can just perform, you know? And I think with athletes, if you've never had an athlete that is just like, completely focused on just the sport and they don't care about training it i think it's a lot easier to get that athlete over here and in tune with their body a little bit more than it is to get somebody maybe that's like o ocd and like over aware of their body to mm -hmm. be able to like tune out and perform right and so that's the way i look at it like there's two ends of that spectrum um and you can have athletes on both sides of the fence right if you have like a really poor performer they're probably over here if you have a really high performer that's dealing with certain issues, maybe that they can't seem to um, get rid of nagging aches and pains, usually they need to spend a little bit more time on this side of things. I think when you're discussing the difference between someone who is uh, extrinsically focused versus someone who's more sensory, I really think it comes down to pain and the existence or how they subsist in pain or if they like dominate their field despite pain. Mm -hmm. uh, the perspective of being in pain is oftentimes reduced like we don't know how much pain we were in until we like alleviate ourselves of it right and athletes are oftentimes the most subject to that pain like they'll be walking around with 
look at LeBron and look at his feet and you'll know enough about if I walked around with feet like that, I'd be so sad. Like I couldn't figure out why it is that the thing that I'm supposed to feel my balance with is just like a hot potato. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> That's so funny. I, if I had that money, the only thing I'd be spending my money on would be like reconstructive massage. <laughs> just having someone just destroy my feet daily. Right. Um, yeah. I think, I think the ability to perceive sensation is contingent on a couple of factors. But like you said, people are stuck in that um, extrinsic state, which I would compare to a focal state. Like their visual field is very like fixed into focus. Their head doesn't necessarily shift to like entertain much of anything aside from what they're taking in sensorily. And if it extends beyond intention, like they, they're not going to be picking up ambient stuff and living in that state of like being very focal on what's in front of you or what's around you uh, starts to develop like this sympathetic tonal display throughout the body where there's reduced sensation, reduced input awareness, but there's uh an expectancy to be able to depend on the body to higher degrees of awareness. So I think in these cases, in the substitution of, I can just pay attention to ambient noise or ambient input or feedback in my body. These people condition themselves to be mind over body. Like they, I want to be able to do this. So I'm going to do this. I'm not going to listen to my feedback as much. And if their foundation is built out such that they can tolerate higher degrees of stress or higher degrees of, um instability without going into uh cortisol mode then awesome which is the case for most athletes because they have enough muscle they have enough like underlying foundation so what it comes down to for me at least in my practice when i'm looking at pe people who say they're very fit or i've been doing this i've been doing this what i look at first is i look at the underlying stability of something like if i wanted to push them over do i see them catching themselves with focus do i see them catching themselves with reflex and then from that, I would determine whether or not, okay, if they're catching themselves off reflex, is this person contingently or consistently, excuse me, in their sympathetics such that they've trained it, they have this tolerance for uh, perceived effort that they don't like immediately go into shutdown mode? Or is this person always cognitively aware of exactly right. how to respond to that? And yeah. regardless of what it is, at the end of the day, what I want for someone to feel is an alleviation of that dependency on tone. So that that tone that focus becomes a tone of the body. It becomes like in the same way the eyes only manage around certain frames of like they're looking within this realm of lens, the body or the sensory parts of the body start to like almost shrink to match that eye pairing. So the hands in particular, you'll see athletes with fucking huge hands. They always have like this big monstrous hand and the one thing you see less of in an athlete is this flaring of the pinky like they don't have that like i'm reaching with my pinky side instead the transition of their two rotating bones reaches into the rotation of the hand so they don't feel like this guy can't rotate and has to abduct to be able to manage rotation of the remainder of the hand so when it comes down to it the majority of people are big enough intrinsically that the tensions they facilitate don't inhibit what I would consider their peripheral ranges. So like if we're fixed in the focal, if we're fixed in the stress mode, more than likely we kind of become like tunnel mode and you'll see a lot of fighters with ears that lift off their head. Yep. So with that said, their skull is not quite aerodynamic anymore because the tensions around their jaw, around their skull are not driving facial tension. Instead it's, it's here. Well, I mean, you can even see if you just squint your eyes, everything here be kind of becomes exactly what you just described. Yeah. So Which imagine is, living in that forever. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I even noticed myself doing that subconsciously when I, I, I wouldn't say I have a lot of stress in my life currently, but I mean, when I do have something stressful happen, that's typically the state that I find myself in. Like I, do this a lot i i can feel sometimes like I'll, I'll almost like cramp in my jaw i used to cramp all the time dude yeah it would just and it would fire sometimes it would be like yeah. this firing type i get locked jaw almost i'd be like oh what the, what's going on right now yep exactly and then i would be like you said here yeah. all the time i've noticed that's gone away i mean to some extent uh 
yeah, I wouldn't say that I'm stuck in like a sympathetic mode all the time. I would say I, I manage stress pretty well now, but that was definitely something I noticed when I was in high school, because even back then, you know, I, I was super into training. I was super into all of the things that we're talking about now. I didn't have the same perspective on it that I do currently. Um, yeah. I was aware of certain things like this. And I remember that time in my life, dude, I was a mess. And that even if you looked at my face back then, like it was, it looked completely different. Like it mm. almost, like it was like long like this. And I was just always like that, just in that constant mode. Um, I remember and this is because you'll probably, I mean, you know, if you know, you followed me for any period of time when I was in high school, dude, I constantly just got in just beef with people all the time. Like I loved it. I loved, it wasn't even like a stress yeah. for me. <laughs> I, it was a lot of adrenaline and that's how I like seeked it out as I would just start shit with people. Yeah. And I've no, I'm still that way by default, but I've gotten better at being able to like kind of manage myself um but but now it's it's definitely still i can see a lot of those myself reverting back to some of those same patterns when i'm engaging with certain people or somebody says something and so it's good to have awareness of that because then when you can feel it happening in your body you can kind of control it from like a bottoms up yeah thing, right? yeah there's the top down, which is like systemic behavior change. And then you have the bottoms up, which is like, okay, what do I actually feel that's happening in my body? And can I like calm that down? And then maybe that will kind of, that will carry back up in, in the sense that like, I'll have like a, a larger change in my behavior in terms of how I'm acting in that. Moment. Yeah. So I have this notion, I have this, uh, it might be a, a reach of like putting the together dots, bear with me. Um, one of the ways that I've seen a lot of correlative like inflammation or lack of sensory uh, input coordination is for me in particular, when I was in that stress state, when I was in that, like, uh, I'm cool getting into confrontation mode, I was same, same, same thing for my high school. And generally, like, growing up as a kid, I was the one sitting outside of class. <laughs> <laughs> so um I used to get nauseous. I used to throw up when I would get interbulated. If there was like too much emotion that I couldn't be coherent through or I couldn't be actionable through, I would get nauseous. And my stomach and like particularly around my liver solar plexus area was like really, really tight. And I'd come to learn in the last couple of years that the relationship between your solar plexus or at least like uh, center abdomen and your amygdala is almost like uh, you press one button, you'll feel lights turn on upstairs. And it goes to show like that fight or flight mode. I was never in fight or flight. I was somewhere in between. There was some degree of like uh, uh, part of me was in fold. Like I wasn't coherent with certain like I want to feel these things, but I'm ready to run through a wall. And yeah, yeah. It, it's that, my opinion. That's the worst place to be because you're yeah. never fully relaxing and you're never fully like in go mode. If you're in go mode, you can't sustain that very long no. because you which is good because then you relax. Yeah. Right. <laughs> kind of back to that post I made on recovery is like, if you want to recover really well, you have to be able to give a hard effort and it's hard to give a hard effort. And it's also hard to learn how to fully relax if you're constantly stuck in that like middle ground. So I didn't want to interrupt you or anything, but that, I thought that was kind of important to add on to that. Yeah. The thing I'm noticing is that the brain is oftentimes a thing that's restricting that quality of control. Like if someone doesn't trust their body to handle the stress, if there's not like a coherence between, Dude, even if it's just like a, a small mismanagement of biomechanics and then someone becomes just that much less stable, their brain mm -hmm. starts to interpret that as worry or threat. And if someone has no uh, quant uh, qualification for, hey, I'm in threat mode, I don't feel good right now, I want to figure out why I'm like this, that immediately mm -hmm. turns on the amygdala, it immediately turns on that stress mode. So yeah. if you look at like, uh, I, and it's oftentimes the clients that I'll see that come from these biomechanic practices they don't have the comfort in being pushed around by the weight or being pushed around by the sensations they're always directing the sensations so in that they're not being like managed by i don't feel comfortable right now i want to figure out how to continue doing this but to make it comfortable because there's no allowance for it when they're doing that like if if it's some like cabling stuff or if it's some go to stuff we're looking at someone taking a body that doesn't necessarily have a foundation, a neurological stability network or framework to be able to switch from top down or 
uh, bottom up. And so that person's stuck in whatever state they're in. And so they're learning something new that efforts perceived as, oh, shit, things are moving faster for me right now. I don't really know how to manage that. So it's either they match that intensity or they compute that the effort is intensity and they don't actually have to work their body up to an adrenal response. And so that is almost like adrenal response happens, but there's nothing to do with it. And they're just stuck in like, ah, dude, this fucking sucks. It's going to hurt. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So you're almost saying that because they've never actually, and you know, uh, I might be wrong about this, but you're basically saying that like their perceived effort when they do something like, because they've never actually pushed themselves doing something that's like genuinely hard. They don't really have this like, internal compass that allows them to like effectively gauge effort on like a uh like a continuum right and so they're kind of stuck in this weird middle ground where they do something that might be stressful and they think it's way more stressful than it actually is because totally. they don't have that that bandwidth basically yeah no coherence and that just comes down to actually this is the new brain old brain stuff so i've gotten a lot of exposure to this uh, this information or like the language of midline and neurology from people who are way more competent in it. So I don't really stem into this is how you choreograph your brain's relationship to the body. I almost divide, uh, I've devised like this uh, limbic response or like how you feel about the words you use kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was young, I hit my head a couple of times and I think that there's some deficiencies that I have that have made me more um, not dependent on my, my forebrain but I work around some tooling or some ambient awareness in it. Like I'm very, very observant, but I'm not always stuck in focus mode. And mm -hmm. so I'm paying attention with my ears too. There's some certain degrees of sensation that I think that are more developed on me just because I hit my head. And right. so, so I've like depended on that shit. Um, the limbic system is your non-speaking brain. It's the brain that has your memories. It has your uh, association to sensation, gives you some perspective of, I feel this way about this thing. And then your neocortex puts words to it. So if that's the case, for majority of us, we skip the fact or skip the valuing system that says this comes from here. And we immediately give value to once we have words on it. Now we have understanding that there's a definite or like there's an objective uh, reality or subjective reality to the thing where we can't justify our words without having a meaning to the feeling behind them. So our emotions happen regardless. Our feeling about the experience happens regardless to give context to threat or safety. It doesn't have anything to do with like, uh, I'm happy about this. I'm sad about this. It has everything to do with, am I going to be survivable here? Or am I at threat at, of like not surviving well enough? And yeah. as soon as someone puts words to something, often they're words that they're, they learn from other people, words that don't really describe their framework. They get fixated in making definite claims about things they don't know they're objectively describing. So, yeah, I, I you've read the book, um, How Emotions Are Made. Mm -hmm. It goes, it, it's actually really interesting because there's, you know, uh, the research that they did basically determined that you can't actually subjectively determine what emotion someone's feeling, right? So, we have like these archetypical. Mm -hmm things that we put labels on like that person smiling so they're happy or yeah. that person frowning so they're sad but <laughs> actually and, and even once you get down to like the level of like adrenaline and cortisol even when you look at a lot of that stuff you can't tell what someone's feeling you can't right. there's no way for you to subjectively determine that person's sad, sad that person's angry um even at a chemical level right because it's not i mean you could people smile when they're angry too All right time, yeah. Yeah. So there's exactly what you're saying makes tons of sense when you actually look at that data as well. That's not just like fluffy, like meta narratives or anything. That's that's true, you know, in the most okay. scientific sense. You know, they've never been able to actually establish how to even determine, um, you know, some of these emotional states. And so when you go and slap a label on that, um, that's just another constraint on uh, the, the individual, basically. Yeah, I think that is a good attention to um, uh, people who are fixed on feeling a certain way or um, actually, no, I, I got a great example for you. I have a buddy uh, and I cannot tell you how frustrating I actually haven't hung out with him uh, since we had like a, a falling out around the subject. 
Um, I'm not the most happy person I've ever met. I'm also not the person that's like objectively trying to uh, see the happy in everything. I think that there's a degree of reality comes first. And then once you've seen reality, you can make your, you can make your bed. I'm the same way. Uh, yeah. And the, <laughs> the first thing he says is like, uh, being happy is a choice. Uh, I don't want to be anything but happy. And then the idea of talking about serious stuff when I try to bring up discussions, like you, you're going to find yourself being happier when you have better tooling to manage around the things that make you unhappy, which is to say you have to put some focus into the effort of this sucks. I'd like to be better. I don't have the ability to change my circumstance right this second, which at the end of the day is a determination of I'm not good enough right now, but I want to be better. And if more people were like, I'm not good enough right now, I want to be better instead of why is this happening to me? Why is this? Why do Why does this hurt? Why? Why does everything? It looks easier for that person. At the end of the day, the reason why people are getting confused is because they're not looking at, like you say, they're not looking at the, the objective or like the feeling that they can identify. They're looking at the feeling that they can observe. And the feeling you can identify no matter what, even if you can't see the emotion, is threat or safety. You can mm -hmm. see someone's person is tonally, I would like to be around that person. That person looks like they have a knife on them. And you can see that. <laughs> well, and that's the thing, too, is like when you actually do, even before you feel fear, um, you know, your body's also processing all of these different sensations, right? And so the sensations kind of inform what emotion you're supposed to feel, right? The emotion comes after that. And so if you can kind of get better at, um, being able to manage these sensations and all of this different information coming in, everything else downstream is going to get better, right? You're going to be able to actually um, modulate, like, you know, you're not going to overreact to things. You're not going to get nervous or scared over things that you shouldn't be misinterpreting that as, um, you know, and then driving those emotional responses. And I think that kind of goes back to what you were saying with, you know, your friend is like, people try to focus on happiness, but happiness is a downstream process of all of these other things that are in front of it. Right. And so it kind of just goes back to a lot of those like corny Instagram posts you see where it's like, you, you know, trying to attain happiness isn't the way you attain happiness. It's like doing things for other people or all of these other things that are like code for, Hey, you actually have to do some work, right? You got to do some work on yourself, you know? You know that the people that are teaching those lessons are bullshitting themselves when they can't say a coherent version of what they're trying to say, when it can't just be like. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I was going to say there's a missing struggle. And you, if without the struggle, like nothing really means anything. <laughs> right. Yep. <laughs> Until April 5th, use code SPRING30 at MoveMed.net for 30% off our online store. That includes our flagship mewing course, the best resource for learning and training the relationships between your swallow, your breathing, and your bite. You can also get our New York seminar recording where you'll learn impactful techniques and see what MoveMed's hands-on application looks like. Lastly, our monthly membership gives access to weekly group classes and a large library of clips and tutorials on various topics. Head to movemed.net and again use code SPRING30 at checkout. So I, I was I was interested to get your guys' take on if you're taking somebody who's coming from this like biomechanics background, could be whatever system and odds are they haven't, maybe they're doing some kind of dynamic work, maybe they're sprinting or whatever, but they're spending most of their time doing low level corrective work, trying to, you know, fix every imbalance or whatever. Um, how, how, what kind of routine would you give them? Like, what are the things that they probably have not been uh, giving themselves as an input um, that would maybe help break them out of like hyper control mode. Dude, I'm going to crush them with a bench press. <laughs> I'm just going to give them anything that actually allows their body to experience some stress for the first time, you know? And I think, again, that just goes back to like these two camps that you have where you have people that are like ultra avoidant of anything that's stressful. And then, uh, like you'll, you'll see a lot of people talking about, um, like with performance, like you shouldn't ever get sore or if you're sore, like you had a bad workout or something. And it completely goes against, Dude. you know, the thing that we want to try to like teach people, not, not necessarily like cognitively, but just on like a systems level. 
um, you know, you're, you're never going to be able to handle or manage a lot of stress because the second you get thrown into a game, that's what's going to happen. You're going to wake up the next day and you're going to be sore, right? So you have to learn how to perform when you're sore and you're stressed. And so I think, I mean, just for somebody that's coming from a camp like that, I think they just need to honestly learn how to like, honestly, just push a set to failure. Something as simple as that, you know, ISOs. I think ISOs are really great for people that are new to training to kind of teach them um, perceived effort because with an isometric hold, there's always that point where like, you feel like you're going to fail, but that you can go after that, you can kind of go an extra like 10 or 15 seconds and so you can kind of teach people uh in like a safe environment you're not going to injure yourself doing an iso split squat you might injure yourself doing a, a 10 rep max back squat or a hack squat or something that's definitely possible but i think with isos that that can be a great way to like teach people how to like bridge where they think they are versus how far they can actually push um and you, you see this all the time with kids where like they come in and they're tra- like maybe it's a one-on-one training session. They're doing an ISO split squat and they hold it for like a minute versus you put them in a group setting and all of a sudden they're competing with somebody else and they get two or three minutes. Right. And so that's a good way to say, Hey, look, like there's so much more effort and there's so much more, um, you know, pain that you can push through. You just need to like give them that uh, you need to show them that. Right. And I think like group settings, if you've, been training like by yourself you have a lot of people now that just like train by themselves in a garage like yeah. like freaking weirdos i do it all the time obviously so I'm, I'm kind of like bashing myself a little bit but it's like dude you need to get around other people yeah. and kind of actually learn how to like train with other people and be pushed a little bit and then again that goes back to you know there's certain athletes that maybe need the opposite of that they need to learn how to be by themselves in a room And they need to learn how to push themselves outside of, you know, having other people just constantly barking at them. So I think it depends on who you're, you're looking at. I think with people in like the training realm that are like, they're professional trainers and they've never actually done a sport. um, Those people need to get around other people that push them a little bit. They need to get kind of environment. Yeah. I think that's a big one. Um, Being mirrored or mirrors. Like, in in all actuality, that's how we learn how to do everything. We observe, we redirect the observation in an action. Um, and the better we are at observing, the more, like, it, Goda talks about math. They talk about there being, like, all this math to a process. And our brains break down information, and they do math, but it's not like that. It's right. like we're, we're watching something, and we're like, all right, right how, do I, how do I do that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, When you're seeing a bunch of people mirror something that's nonsensical, you see this almost disassociation from the herd and always like following the the language to figure out a meaning. So everyone almost has this misconstrued meaning for it. And when they try to apply it in different ways, there's only so much range for it because you can't be creative around something that has so much stricture. Right. Well, you're trying to reverse engineer something that's supposed to be innate. Yeah. In and trying, yeah and, yeah exactly and you're trying to like just create that you're just trying to mimic a position basically yeah that's a i mean when you see in yoga i love yoga for the sake of what it could do i don't like yoga for what it does do i mean if you think about someone right. doing a pressurized drill uh say any of these people were doing something with a weight vest on in order for them to do it they'd have to retain some buoyancy when they're doing their exercises so that exercise isn't just like much heavier where the weight vest is now if you think in terms of putting yourself in a position where you can't uh aerate as well or you can't breathe as well it's the same as putting the weight vest on kind of and you're going to be affected by gravity depending on the position you bend in so essentially all you're really doing is re-atmosphere re-atmospherizing or like creating an atmospheric agonist in your lungs in the different positions if you can do that you can probably earn the positions over time there's not a single person finding themselves adjusting or like when you're pulling on something there's a degree of how much can you take and how much can you give uh that allows for you to get to your full reach everyone's trying to pull first and there's no allowance for that like how much can i risk there being like a how how vulnerable am i or how durable am i all these like 
I have to hold my position. I have to hold my form. It's almost like the glue that is their fascia is non-existent unless their brain says so. <laughs> you don't have the fundamental, like you're physically attached to yourself. Right. Yeah. That's why we don't have to put our hands on at the start of the day. You are physically integrated. So the people that are like, all right, we're going to have to. Dude. <laughs> do that yesterday with a stick they were holding a stick over their head and they were like doing this yeah and they're like or something and i'm like i mean i think if you were to ask somebody i think there's a lot of value in taking somebody who has literally none of this knowledge mm-hmm. none of the shit that we're talking about and you just sit them somewhere and you say hey take a look at that oh my God. <laughs> or you do something right yeah. and and now there's definitely, I'm not saying that's accurate because you'll definitely see people in the comment section of like things that I post or that other good accounts post. And you're like, what the fuck is that? Right. Yeah. But there is something there underlying that I think a lot of people realize when they see something that it, that it's just not like it's either too robotic or there's no fluidity involved in it. And I think people subconsciously pick up on that. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, when you watch sports, there's a reason you can you can look at somebody and instantly know, regardless of how strong they are or how fast they are, whether they're confident in their sport, um, whether they have a lot of practice. Right. I mean, you see some people that are just stiff and like they're moving like a robot and you can tell it's like their second or first time playing basketball. Right. I mean, you can take people that are great athletes in one context, put them in another sport and you can instantly see it in their bodies. You know, not hard. And, and it's funny because when you look at some of these positions that people are trying to like recreate or mimic, it, it just, it literally looks like a bad athlete. Yeah. Like that's the vibe you get. Like, dude, that doesn't even like, it's so robotic. It's so disconnected. And it's not to say that there's not a time and place for things that are, uh, you know, very isolated and, and uh, I guess driven mechanically like that. But when you're, when you're talking about like, taking something in a context that's supposed to like transfer directly to a sport or help you move better in the context of like running or something that's very like hind brain. Um, there's just no connection there whatsoever. Yeah. You had said the, um, the relationship, um, how you can see the confidence in someone's behavior when they're playing their sport. It trans- transitions out of that as soon as they're out of their sport. Um <laughs> Confidence is not so much like assertion or like aggression, which a lot of people kind of uh, coordinate it with. It's like if you can see someone in a threatening environment or an environment where they're being contested and that person doesn't display degrees of actionable defensiveness or I'm aware of the the agonist or the person that's trying to say no to me right now and I'm still doing my thing. Uh, ideally you'd see that person instead of having a focus there, they're just like, I'm just going to do this better. That's going to be, that's going to figure itself out. Mm -hmm. I see a ton of people trying to coordinate. And this is actually something that really bothered me about FP. And I have been asking to understand it, but facial expression stuff like, uh, the now he talks about some degree of like, not showing what's going on inside on your face. And I have this emphasis that if we're top down creatures, if our brain is the non feeling organism that kind of manages and monitors the feeling organism, then we have this notion that the feelings we have are justified by the physical self, they're uh, languaged or put into categories in our brain. If you're telling the thing that's like the feeling right in front of the thinking, how to feel you're almost telling your whole body what it can and cannot do just because this is like you have 10 cranial nerves that are yelling at you, what you are, how you are, where you are. Yeah. Yeah. You're trying to control it again from, you know, you need to control it from here at the source or not necessarily control it, but just find ways to like, if you don't like how you're feeling, you need to find ways to manage uh, whatever, like, uh, sensations and and uh, stimuli that you're receiving as opposed to like let's just change the emotion itself because it's not the emotion it's the sensation yeah. right that's how it that's how emotions are made and that's what that book is about that i was referencing earlier is like how do we actually get to an emotion right yeah that's that's what everybody wants to focus on is the emotion but that there's 
all of these steps before that that need to be addressed. So I, it comes down to how pliable can we be in a non-heavy tonal state? So like um, for most of us, when we're like without tone or we're just like kind of ambiently charged up, we're not, we're either susceptible to injury or we have like our resting, I can manage most things. If that state is pretty durable, you're in a pretty good state. But for most of us in order to get there, we have to be able to actualize like being able to pump tissue that usually gets tense and if we're very incoherent through our hands and feet particularly if we look to a bottom-up approach then we're more than likely building out musculature in a input output inversion like we're paying mm -hmm. attention to the output first and we're right. directing our inputs to coordinate that output as opposed to let's listen to what's going on let's see where we are take a step back it doesn't need to happen right this second and then like I've worked a lot on my hands, my, you can see that my hands are different sizes and they weren't like that last year, but my this right, the, hand, uh, this one bigger, I guess guy. that would be right. Yeah. Yeah. And you can see like it, the planes are different. So like this is flat and then this goes off at an angle where this is all flat. And mm -hmm. so I put my hand up to my buddy. We've known each other since we were like 16 and I did this to him. Wow. Yeah. So my right hand is bigger and it's not so much that I like put more ab muscle here and I put more shoulder muscle here. It's the fact that it has the ability to uh, engorge better. And so when I'm making a grip, I'm making a grip around my hand still feeling and it's not just like locking off all of its sensory data. And if people live in a body that's locking off all their sensory data or at the very least listening to the loudest nerves, then they're going to find that they only have the ability to orient around those sensations and they don't even have the ability to like modify, say uh, I'm super toe heavy and I don't know how to uh, lay my foot down without it, like creating that bunion shape on the side. More often than not, I will bet you money on this causes from this because their thumbs are fucked up. Their toes are fucked up. Same side sensation, opposite side mechanical and so everyone's either mechanically or sensorily adjusting every moment because they don't have the ability to perceive those sensations in like a fluid input relationship. And so you would say that because the sensations come first, that the reason that you're seeing that in the hands and also in the feet is because the part of the brain that's kind of receiving that sensory input, um, I guess it would be kind of like the homoculus diagram where those things are so close together in terms yeah. of like in the neural tissue that controls both of them, that you're kind of seeing that quote unquote dysfunction in the hands and the feet because it's it's originating kind of from the same, almost the same spot in the brain, basically, in terms of like how you're getting that sensory input. Totally. Yeah. If you, I mean, our core, it's so interesting. I, I'd be interested to know what you perceive as the core. I know you don't like delve into like describing things and being like, this is how fitness is. This is what this is. This is what this is. Cause it's not really where your focus is at present, mm -hmm. but it's largely been not so much my focus, but I'm responding to how other systems have said, this is the way it is. This is the way it is. And I'm like, that's not the way it is. Cause I went there and I tried that shit. That was a whack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to uh, essentially deliver that there's a, relationship between if we thought like we had centric tissue like our midbrain was our like foremost formative core and that core goes through like a popsicle stick then yep. it relates to us in the same way that the pelvic floor and the palate intercorrelate relates yeah. to us in the same way that our uh deuterosome we started as an asshole in a mouth and yep. uh, uh, a second mouth which was our our gut yep. and if we create this fucking chamber, if this chamber is what we are first, and then we essentially create skeleton around that, we create nervous system around that, then the thing that we have to do in order for us to grow our arms out is to grow the trunk. To manage this better first. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly what I was going to say. I don't know if you've read. Uh, um, I think I actually have it. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, muscle and, muscles and meridians or something like that. It's a very... Uh, dense complicated book mm -hmm. uh, a lot of a lot of the go to guys reference it i honestly don't know how they've read that book does it have pictures um, do what does it have pictures um yeah i think well then that's that's your answer 
Well, I, no, it has a few pictures in it, but <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, this is so cool. <laughs> that, yeah, exactly. That's basically the entire book, though, is is it goes into embryology, and it, it says basically exactly that. Um, and it describes pretty much how, you know, this is this is this comes first, everything else comes after in terms of like reaching out into the world, right? Yeah. Um, you have to be okay here. And I think this even kind of goes back to like emotions as well, in terms of like, are you okay enough with yourself to be able to reach out into the world and okay. to do yeah. and help other people so it's really freaking weird how you can you can see these like principles and everything even with like trees and roots and things oh, yeah we're an onion we have layers yep <laughs> yeah i think that's really interesting how that uh a lot of people have come to that conclusion through different lines of inquiry even just completely non-related fields yeah tai chi is one of those ones where there's a lot of like uh people will find their uh ebb and flow like the give and take they'll find this notion of languaging their uh relationship with like emotional motion and people will i think that that's a really helpful way to orient the limbic uh neocortex relationship um i think the biggest thing that people need to decide is that therapy is not a distinction from um uh, movement they I mean, they both practice the same parts of the brain. It's just that if we don't have there be a, a dialogue as if they're two different people with the same intention, uh, like it's a relationship kind of, then there's going to be one that takes over and one that's kind of just along for the ride. Um, I wanted to ask you this, because this is, we were talking earlier, I just forgot about it. Um, I have this notion that because we're here down, this is our first grip. So like our hands form after some of the gripping capacity of our jaw. And so the way uh -huh. that I carry around tension, I used to carry around a lot. And that was like a focal that I had to manage because I couldn't up here, but you've done combat sports. So I assume you your visual field and your vestibular system is kind of just like not as stable as it could be in some respects. And one of the ways that I see that stress take over for people, especially like the red faced trainers that you like look at online, they're like, you just need to work harder. You need to get, yeah. and then you see this, this vein. And then this like perpetual splotchiness. You're like, yeah. do you consider yourself a healthy individual? Do you consider Dude, yourself someone that's well off? Yeah. Well, and it's not to say that we don't, I think everybody has a lot of these small little things going on all the time, but you definitely see it manifesting in people where, I mean, even if you just want to look at it from a physiology standpoint, I think all of those things are obviously tied together where, okay, now you have, you know, you've just taken a bunch of antibiotics and you bolt for four months straight. And so your blood pressure is higher. And so that feeds into this. And then this and the stress state also feeds back into this. And it's just this constant loop where you have people, they're not addressing all of these different components that are like interlinked with each other, where, you know, you have diet, you have the sleep, you have the movement side of things, you have how you manage tension, the biomechanics or you know, the, the structural side of things. And you look at a lot of these people that like in the evidence-based craft out, they're talking about, uh, like if, if someone from that camp were to listen to half the things we're saying right now, they'd be like, oh, that's bullshit. There's no evidence for that. And it's like, dude, just look at your, just take two seconds and look at your face, bro. <laughs> yeah. <It's fucked> yeah. Up. <laughs> you know? Like what are they doing with their teeth? <laughs> yeah, right. And People can't seem to like connect the dots. It, it's like, okay, well, we don't have evidence for that. So it's complete bullshit. And then you, you have people on the opposite side of that aisle where it's like, it's, it's an OCD. Every little thing is an issue type of an attitude. And I guess that's kind of where I have spent the majority of my time when it comes to nutrition, training, biomechanics is like, how do you actually bridge that gap and find the things that are useful um, where you're not OCD, like just, paying attention to, you know, all of these details that really might not have that big of an impact at the end of the day versus, okay, I'm just going to ignore all of them, you know? I grew up with uh, some, like, uh, developmental issues that I couldn't put, a, like, a like a finger on. And it could have been from, like, uh, like I said, hitting my head as a young kid or traumas, like uh, we had a fire when I was three or some deaths when I was younger. Uh, what... 
I find at the end of the day is I've always been looking for that easement, not to say like I wanted the things to stop happening, though I did. I wanted for there to be like a, a different change in how I received them. I didn't want to like fix into uh, having trouble sleeping, having trouble being around people who didn't get it. That was a trouble, like walking around being intensified by experience and then seeing people who can't even put language to what they're seeing in you, let alone being able to respond to the things that you wanted to uh, get some better feedback on. So with that said, I see a lot of people are getting stuck um, uh, feeling a certain way over time just because they've never learned to manage uh, or assess how they feel and want to feel. And there's like never been a dialogue of I feel this way, I want to feel another way. And it's mm -hmm. almost like the way that we choreograph or coordinate our ability to say I've done successful things here, I've not, is the reaction other people have to you. And if we're to choreograph like that, because I know I'm not, a, I'm not, uh, since a young age, I've always known that I was more competent in a lot of ways than a lot of other people. There were certain things that I, I couldn't figure out why I was having trouble, like being easy when I was trying to do stuff I knew I could do. Right. And asking yeah. people who never had that understanding or never even had that dialogue with themselves, it doesn't help. It doesn't make it easier to understand that. Um, I, I guess I just making a point because I've been I, like, I cannot tell you how profoundly annoyed I am by people who are, as you say, someone that's halfway through their their 15th gear cycle and they've been doing nothing but growing their skull density for the last 15 years and their head's bigger for sure. But <laughs> they also have sleep apnea and some degree of like intestinal issues that come from just a <laughs> constant state of neuroinflammation. And I just like to point out that Anyone that has this, if you walk up to a dog and this dog is red faced and it's like intense, you're not going to pet that dog. I see so many men who are like yeah. prolapsing from the inside of their brain. Like you can see the hemorrhaging vein and then there's almost like no connective tissue between their neck and skull. So it's like, it's really soft here. It's super yeah. hard in the center mass. Yeah. And th this person has no awareness that the thing that essentially coordinates information from here into your organs is not able to do that. So it's like, I have to brace my whole system to make everything be coherent, or at least make what I'm feeling here to make sense to here. And um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Long story short, every single person I'm seeing do this, they take their exercise and they jump straight into another stress bearing thing. If it's ice baths, if it's doing some uh, type of corrective exercise without building out the foundation of effort or tolerance. If it's like doing some biomechanics restructuring and jumping on a curved treadmill thinking like, oh, I'm getting my cardio in. At the end of the day, the only thing that's going to really make a difference for anyone that's super stressed out, go for a walk, try to be like smiling around other people. If you're unable to make eye contact with another person and exemplify a feeling or expression that you want to feel that they're not expressing, then you are not able to create something without feeling threat by other people, or you're not able to create something that doesn't uh, exist based on other people's perception of it. Yeah. And you need to get into you, focus on fucking how you feel so you're not making other people feel gross. Yeah, and I think it's funny because we kind of, get there's things that we get in in like um different <coughs> contexts like like what you just said makes complete sense if you want to talk like psychology and just being um uh you know like that you go to therapy you might hear somebody say something along similar lines but the second you try to take a conclusion like that and apply it to training it's pseudoscience right it's like how are how is it any different right it's the same thing it's the same person it's the same human uh, it, it's in a different context right now. We're training or we're doing something else. And I think what you were saying about people, you know, holding tension a lot is like, you'll see people do some of the easiest exercises. I mean, it could be like a sideline breathing girl and you look at their hand and they're just like this the entire time. It's like, dude, yeah. like, you know, yeah. and it, yeah, it, you're it, holding on to, right. Sometimes it can be the simplest things where it's like, Hey, like, let's just, Let's get you to do something stressful, but like learn how to like manage yourself a little bit better while you're doing it, you know? And mm -hmm. that's why I think stuff like the ice baths, I think for some people, once you get to a certain place, that stuff is a great tool. But sure. for most 
overkill. It's it's overkill. It's way it's too much too soon, right? And so you're just adding back all of these things that uh, you're already struggling with. The second you get in an ice bath, oh yeah, you know, yeah, it's it's the exact same problem, but probably like just amplified times ten. <laughs> yep. The stress people don't realize they can die from that. I've seen someone go yeah. into an ice bath and he literally it was a sunny day. He had to stand outside and some idiot that was running it was like lecturing him through like, all right, you want to do this and you do this. And this is literally having his shock response. And at the end of the day, you can't take someone from a stressful experience of working out, put them into a, a stressful environment and expect for them to be coherent if they can't be coherent in a conversation of stress. Like there's a degree of relationship with self that most people don't have. 100% dude. I mean, I would not be surprised if you didn't see like, people tons of people dying from heart attack from doing uh, freaking ice paths you know it sounds stupid but i mean the way most people uh are able to handle and manage stress is so poor that i wouldn't be surprised and then you add a bad diet on top of that you add uh some other things that i won't mention on here <laughs> that you probably know what i'm talking about you add that stuff on top of it you add medications on top of it and it's just a recipe for disaster and i think that's really what fitness has become is like these just little snippets of things that people like take Compound these right. bits that they've seen from a study and it's like oh cold does this heat does this let's apply it to this person that hasn't done literally any of the groundwork to get there yeah. um even in the supplement space and this is something that like i'm probably going to do a full length post on, but you know, you have people talking about like testosterone and like optimizing mitochondria now, and they don't realize that can cause like serious issues for people in terms of like inflammation and even like the progression of cancer. When you introduce yeah. a ton of testosterone or you start ramping up energy production and you don't have like a base to be able to handle that, um, yeah. you know, that's dangerous. That's what a lot of people in like the biohacking space are trying to get people to, uh you know do now is like you gotta optimize your you gotta micro optimize your testosterone and you gotta take 10 different things for your mitochondria right and a lot of that stuff can be great once you've laid a good foundation right, right. Yeah. it's like you, you're trying to like uh you know rev up the engine and you haven't even built out like the car yet right it's like you don't have you can't go anywhere with that and right. i think hmm. go ahead. i was gonna say it's like painting a dirty room i was just yeah yeah you're you're trying to uh what is that saying polish a turd you know it's like yeah. you're, you're, all of these things that are great um but the reality is those a lot of those things could be harming you in the long run if you're not building out a lot of the uh just basic habits first so it's and that exists in the nutrition space it exists in the fitness space um it's everything that you know you have like a if there's a big audience for it there's probably not a lot of nuance going into the, in the conversation. I did. I did want to ask with uh, the diet side of things, because there's been a little bit of a, a pendulum swing. Well, one first towards pro metabolic in terms of like sugar, easy fuel. Why are we restricting ourselves with this? We're keeping ourselves in stress state to like, Oh, we have diabetes now. So we're going to try to find yeah. a middle ground. And that, I imagine that foundation of just nutrition is part of the foundation that you're talking about overall of terms like, okay, now we can add more to it. Um, what, in terms of, especially somebody who's like training pretty hard, like you're not going to go full keto, right? Um, right. You know, have you kind of like found a sweet spot for yourself or for some of your athletes? Yeah. Um, you know, I think when it comes to, and again, it, when you're dealing with people that have extreme issues, like, uh, obviously I don't treat people with cancer, but you do see uh so like context where maybe a lower carb diet for a period of time or like even a carnivore diet for somebody that has ibs might be really useful as like a short-term strategy but i think the goal of training the goal of nutrition the goal of supplementation all of the stuff that we talked about already is to get people in back to a balanced state where they can eat a little bit of carbs they can eat some sugar they can eat some fat and they're not having to like play this game of like micro optimizing everything where it's like, like okay well i can't eat carbs because you know uh that like it fuels cancer cells or something and then I, I can't like just eat a ton of sugar over here because obviously there's issues with um insulin sensitivity and so i think just kind of 
you have to obviously look at the person that's in front of you. And if somebody has a really serious issue, you may need a more extreme approach. But I think with most people, it's good to kind of just start with something basic where it's like, okay, we can have some carbs, we can have some protein. If we notice that we're eating some foods maybe that are causing issues, right? Like we're getting gas or bloating, we can remove those, we can replace them with something else. I had IBS for, you know, years, um, probably about two years. And what I found through that entire experience was that, you know, being overly restrictive does help in terms of managing symptoms, but long-term it doesn't fix the issue um, because you're just managing symptoms, right? You're not like actually getting to the root of the problem, which is something emotional. Maybe it's something that you need to add in. Uh, or remove from the diet temporarily. And then, you know, once I got to a point where, you know, I had basically cured my IBS, I was able to introduce, you know, just a normal diet where I'm eating carbs, I'm eating sugar, I'm eating protein, kind of a, just a balanced uh, palate in terms of, you know, the, the food options. And so I think it's going to be a little bit different with everybody that you work with. For people that don't have huge issues, um, honestly just a balanced diet is really the way to go i think you know you and when you really begin to look at okay like uh anti-nutrients and vegetables and then you got uh you know on the meat side if you're just eating meat you have a ton of saturated fat so you have issues with both of these things that do have scientific backing like you know there, there is an issue with eating too many vegetables there is an issue with eating too much saturated fat and the answer is just like have both but don't overeat right and, and it's going to be different you might have to play around with that a little bit to determine what your optimal dose is uh, but i think that's the problem that we've kind of created for ourselves is, is we hyper focus in on the benefits of one thing so like okay carnivore is great if you have gut issues and then we take and run with that and we say carnivore is great for everything uh or you know we have antioxidants and phytochemicals and all these important things and vegetables so let's go vegan and let's destroy our gut you know and there's no balance there in terms of hey look we can eat some vegetables maybe we need to find the right vegetables for us right like for me i can't eat broccoli and onions or i couldn't at one point uh just because it would blow my gut up so i just focused on eating things that didn't give me issues at the time um and so you're gonna have to navigate that it's obviously better if you have someone qualified that can help you um, you're going to have to navigate that yourself, but the goal, in my opinion, is always to get people back to balance, right? Like a little bit of everything in terms of training, diet, nutrition, supplements. Uh, I think that that's ultimately the, the thing that's worth, worth striving for. I think generally making options for anything is, <clears throat> should be the end all be all of the person coaching, like, uh, in diet, in fitness, like, the way that you can pretty safely assess if a system is for you is if they tell you someone who has limited options that they're going to limit your options. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Totally. Um, how's your one arm, one arm hang going? You're still chasing the record. <laughs> Dude. It's so funny. You asked that I got like, it was probably like a week ago. I had a coach that commented on one of my posts. He's like, nobody cares about that one arm hang. He's like, He's like, let's see you deadlift 600, which I already have. I've deadlifted 640. So I think it's funny when people will say, they're like, that's a dumb goal. I'm like, I don't know. I think it's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I don't know. I'm So I got, I had two minutes and 53 seconds. That was like the best I ever got. Yeah, bro. Um, which was, I think, about 40 seconds away from the uh, world record. So. What I'm doing right now, I've never been able to like replicate that again. So I'm just taking like every week, I'll add like I'll add a pound or two to like an adjustable dumbbell. So my logic is like, if I can get to the point where I can hold two minutes with a hundred pounds, I'm gonna break it, right? There's no way. <laughs> so I just have to kind of like progress it from the point of like, okay, this is what I can currently do and like get my capacity really high. So and honestly, it's made my shoulders feel great too, and my grip is, you know, ridiculous now. So there's obviously other benefits to it aside from just saying that I had a world record. That's legit. Yeah. I'm sure that overlays into everything. I could only imagine there was a point where I was, uh, I was working for a, uh, like a manual labor company a couple of years ago 
and I got into the point where like the back of the the truck is like metal latches and shit like that. And I had popped the latch off of the back of the truck. Like oh. when when you're doing enough grip training, it translates yeah. to the whole body getting so strong. I was stronger than I ever been. <laughs> it it does. Almost everything feels and becomes a little bit more effortless. You yeah. know, because you don't have that like inhibition at the hand. It's like boom, oh. you grab and then it carries through, you know, into the entire body in terms of like how stable you feel. Yeah, that uh, layering effect, how uh, one thing can be another thing in different form. This is your grasp on life. So your relative competency or your ability to perceive information here is going to be contingent on how big your grasp on life is. Yep, 100%. It's, uh, I always look at it as proximal to distal, but it's also distal to proximal in a lot of ways, too. It's really not one or the other. It's both. Yeah feedback always assessing yep cool beans um do you have any more questions that you thought would no i mean uh, I'm, I'm um, sure keep going but yeah go, go ahead grant if you got anything oh no my i was gonna i was gonna answer i didn't realize he was talking to you <laughs> oh you if you had if you had a question too i was just thinking like we're on the tail end so if we wanted to hit something at the end yeah um i don't think so see what time we got right here yeah, I got to get going here in a minute, but um, I definitely, I know I've talked to you before about doing a session with you uh, and just kind of like looking at the hands, because I remember you had mentioned something about the thumb. So I definitely want to do that. Um, that's super interesting to me because I think when you're looking at yourself, it's different than when you have somebody else looking at you. There's always things that you're going to avoid looking at no matter how uh, I guess, aware and competent you are. And so that's kind of, I would love to do that and kind of see what your perspective is on me and where I'm currently at in terms of, you know, just function, I guess you could say, for lack of a better word. Sure. Yeah. I mean, for you, I just give you a little more space. I, I think that majority of us, you can think in terms of potentiation, if like our skull isn't at its fullest, then the communicable translation of the neck into the ribs and the whole body's not going to be at its fullest. So I'd probably just give you like 20% more space in your body. Like your hands would, especially around that crook where you have a little bit of that injury in the the thumb, we'd give mm -hmm. you a depth to the palm. So the way I look at it, this is, if you were, we're talking to face or front line or the dynamics of three-dimensionality in the body, these are our faces. This is where our ears would be located. This is the back of our head. So our extensors are the spine side. This is a four side. If we think about deepening our foreside into our backside, so like put your hand up just for a sec. And then I want you to give a little squeeze between the groins of the finger. So you feel so, like, like these basically or at the bottom. So like uh, the crooks down here. What do you mean when you say squeeze? Uh, imagine you had something in between like a cigar oh. cutter and you're trying to cut the cigar, get down here and not up here. That's kind of hard. <laughs> Yeah. So the reason why that's hard is because the relationship between your internal and external rotation is kind of stuck here. So you find it happening in the hand. So like the space from here to here is probably if you make a fist, show me a fist. I like start from here. Mm -hmm. OK, so actually pretty good. I think your wrist is pretty stable. I would just say that you probably are missing a little bit of extension through the knuckles. You probably have some heavy joints here like if you poke here it probably feels like the knuckle bed is pushing forward yeah yeah it does yeah so that's just yeah. suggests you're missing out on a little bit of the overreach like the shoulder overreach like the elbow overreach there's a, a slight degree of extension just a slight degree that helps transition between joints or transition between uh areas and that's oftentimes short on most people just because we haven't facilitated the high end points of extension. So, for example, you're looking at neutral for a second. I want you to put your hand to the back of your neck, like right at the insertion of skull and neck. Yeah. And then you're going to look downward. Do you feel that area right at skull and spine being soft right now? Uh, it almost feels like there's like a small knot there. Okay. On the right side. Okay. So try looking up while you're still feeling it, like your eyes scan up. Just my eyes? Yeah. So, so head in the same spot, but eyes go up. Yeah. Do you feel any changes there? 
Try to look up to your extreme. I can feel uh, it, it. I mean, I can feel the muscles there moving. If that, mm -hmm. I can. Feel cool. So the fact that they're like registering something is good, but for the most part, most people's spines are compressed here, and that's to suggest that the transition into jaw and skull is kind of like convoluted. It's not really very clear. This should be bigger. So like expanding. Mm -hmm. And it should reflect the space that the jaw transitions into the skull because that's what gives you the space for your tongue. And if you're not existing in that full degree of extension, you're going to try to extend from your tongue or your chin as opposed to it being found in the spine. So our visual system immediately corresponds with the activity of flexion extension in the top of the spine so for most of us if we're fixated into being slightly flexed just slightly tense there's going to be a degree of depreciation globally okay yeah that that makes a lot of sense actually yeah but i don't see that being a huge issue honestly you're very fit <laughs> little stuff little stuff yeah <laughs> i like to micro oh, so. micro optimize i like that micromanage micro optimize you're like <laughs> I'm way ahead of that. I'm just making things better. <laughs> <laughs> no big issue. That's a good place to be. Yeah, definitely. I really appreciate it, man. Um, cool. Yeah. Uh, it's been a good conversation and it was cool meeting you. Yeah. You yeah. You guys too. It was, uh, it was great doing this. I think we should definitely do another one where we can kind of go into some of the more detailed aspects of some of the stuff we mentioned. Cause I think there's a lot to unpack there. So I'd agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People are watching like, I don't know what the fuck they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> some people will get it some will, but that's fine. It's like, uh, it's a it's selective for, body. Yeah, this is for us. This is for us. <laughs> but I think the language that we're using is starting to become more prevalent. It's just it the is. application of it and, and understanding all the parallels between like the training uh, sphere and how it relates to your real world uh, uh, ability to take in inputs. I thought somebody was behind me. Did you see that? <laughs> It was like there was like a shadow going through that that back window right there. I was like, "What the hell?" <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I I completely agree with that though. I think it's definitely becoming uh, you know, you have guys like Huberman now and people that are talking a little bit more about the psychology component and how it interacts with the physical. And I think it's becoming a, a topic that people are actually interested in listening to now. So we're growing up as a society. Yeah, finally. <laughs>